Good afternoon from Tokyo. I'm Jeffrey Ordinio, Assistant Professor of International Security Studies at Tokyo International University. Welcome to TIU Global Dialogue. Our discussion today will focus on Vietnam and its foreign policy. The Southeast Asian country has probably caught your attention at some point since the COVID-19 pandemic started. Indeed, Vietnam has been hailed by many for its effective handling of this once in a century global public health crisis. Despite bordering China, where coronavirus originated, Vietnam has only recorded less than 4,000 cases and 35 deaths. In fact, it has overperformed developed countries, including Japan, in suppressing community transmission and minimizing impact to the local economy. This is perhaps a testament to the country's rising status. But Vietnam's rise has been over three decades in the making. Following the Doi Moi reform in 1986, along with many domestic policy shifts, there were significant changes to how Hanoi dealt, dealt with the world. Indeed, the Socialist Republic of Vietnam moved quickly away from being an isolated country reliant on the support and recognition of the former Soviet Union and shunned by neighbors to a proud nation with active bilateral and multilateral engagements. Today, Vietnam is seen as one of the most consequential actors shaping the region's security and economic architecture. Its defense partnerships are robust. In the South China Sea, it has championed a rules-based approach. Its economic growth is impressive. In 2020, while most economies were weighed down by the COVID-19 pandemic, Vietnam registered positive economic growth. For the first quarter of this year, I think the economic growth was 4%. And this is made possible, or this was made possible by an effective response to this public health crisis and by attracting, continuously attracting foreign investments and through Vietnam's very favorable trade policies. For today's session, we are delighted to be joined by Professor Thuy T. Do of the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. We'll discuss Vietnam's foreign policy in the 21st century. Just a little bit about our speaker. Thuy T. Do is Associate Professor of International Relations at the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam and is currently posted at Vietnam's permanent mission, the United Nations, World Trade Organization, and other international organizations in Geneva. She obtained a doctoral degree from the Department of International Relations, Australia National University in 2016. She previously held visiting fellowships at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, the East West Center, and Japan's Institute for International Affairs, or JIIA. Her research interests include non-Western international relations theory, multilateralism, East Asian studies, and Vietnam's foreign policy. Before I turn over to our speaker, uh, just some disclaimers. The views expressed in this webinar do not necessarily reflect the views and official positions of Tokyo International University or of the speaker's home institution. All remarks, including those during the question and answer portion are on the record and we are live, not just through the Zoom platform, but also on Facebook. So please be mindful of those. All right, so without further ado, let me turn over to Professor Do. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeffrey O'Daniel. Uh, you set a very perfect background for the presentation. Uh, what Vietnam has been doing uh, over uh, the past years and also what it has achieved and also uh, Vietnam emerging role in uh, uh, the regional and also global affairs. So thank you for your nice introduction. Okay, uh, uh, can you have showing the slide? Master? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so today my presentation will focus on discussing about Vietnam foreign policy in the 21st century. So I focus on uh, what Vietnam have been uh, conducting uh, in its diplomacy and uh, what we say foreign affairs in the past two decades and uh, emphasizing on these um, main subject. So uh, next slide please. 
So uh, like other countries, uh, the foundation of Vietnam foreign policy making in the 21st century based on certain uh, uh, pillars. Uh, the first one is um, the changing international and regional context as the, the moment. And it is uh, um, without doubt uh, that is uh, the rise of China and the growing uh, strategic competition among the great powers uh, in uh, the region and also the global affairs. And the second pillar is about Vietnam uh, development objective. So the purpose uh, is to, uh, the first thing, ensuring um, the uh, peaceful and stable surrounding environment for the Vietnam uh, development. And also Vietnam trying to implement uh, the MDG, the Mi uh, Millennium Development Goals, and now the Sustainable Development Goals with the uh, hope that Vietnam can be a uh, middle uh, income countries uh, by 2020 or 2025. And now uh, um, also with the uh, bring about the sustainable aspect in terms of environment, climate change uh, and uh, other sustainable uh, aspect of uh, development, including uh, improving equalities and uh, uh, security for the people. Uh, the three, the, the third factors is about the national power and status. And thank you, uh, Professor Odani and have just uh, make uh, an overall remarks that uh, the national power and status of Vietnam has been increasing over the past uh, decade. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we, uh, as I will show later in terms of at the multilateral and bilateral dimension of, of this uh, kind of Vietnam uh, rising national power and status. And uh, number four is the Vietnam uh, national interest, which I will uh, elaborate uh, later on. And also, uh, we also have uh, the changing mindset uh, in terms of identities uh, and mindset, uh, which allow room for Vietnam moving from isolated uh, with a country during the cold later uh, period of the Cold War to uh, an open and integrated economy at the moment. And the last point is um, the guiding motto for Vietnam foreign policy at the moment. We go back to the Ho Chi Minh uh, thought, um, was it a long time ago? Uh, uh, actually, this go with the saying uh, that uh, the Vietnam foreign policy and diplomacy in overall uh, is firm in principle. The principle here is the Vietnamese value and um, interest, but we also be uh, flexible in the strategy and tactics that um, was it, is relevant and is correspondent to the changing environment uh, of the region and the world um, at that time. So I think that the, those uh, uh, set the background for the making of Vietnam foreign policy um, uh, uh, since Domoy and particularly in the 21st century. Uh, can I have a slide, please? And next slide. Okay, so uh, the core pillar of Vietnam foreign policy in the 21st uh, century, I think it had four aspects. Uh, the first one is multilateralism. Uh, the second one is uh, integration, which is pretty much related to uh, the notion of uh, multilateral approach. And the third thing is about partnership and uh, uh, related one is uh, diversity, uh, diversification of relationship and ties. Uh, I will discuss uh, in specific uh, each uh, key pillars. Next slide, please. So, uh, we can see that how Vietnam has uh, adopted uh, a multilateral approach in its foreign policy uh, is a change remarkably uh, because uh, in the 1980s, uh, Vietnam is still a very isolated country uh, due to uh, uh, the deteriorated relation with China, uh, Southeast Asia, and so the uh, Cambodian conflict. But at the moment, uh, you can see that since Vietnam uh, joined ASEAN in 1995, and in 2007, it joined the WTO. And at the moment, multilateralism is seen as one of the key pillars for the conducting of Vietnam policy. So uh, it's had chair ASEAN, um, let's say three times since it um, uh, became a member. So in 1998, 
in 2010 and most recently in 2020. So in 2020, just last year, Vietnam forged uh, the ASEAN chairmanship based on the uh, notion of forging a cohesive and responsive ASEAN uh, in the time of uh, many uncertainty and also growing strategic uh, competition among the big power and also some concern about the internal divide within ASEAN uh, member state. So uh, Vietnam want to fought the ASEAN um, uh, unity and also responsiveness to uh, emerging challenges such as the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and also red power competition. And also uh, at uh, the UN level, so uh, Vietnam has been uh, a member since 1977. Uh, uh, and at the moment it has uh, twice Serve as the UNSC, uh, uh, United Nations Security uh, Council, uh, non permanent members in 2008 and 2009. And at the moment, was it, uh, for the tenure of 2020 and 2021. And during uh, the times that uh, Vietnam served as the UNSC non permanent member, it's a try to uh, uh, make the contribution to resolving international conflict and also in terms of uh, promoting to uh, international peace and uh, security by bringing up uh, the issues like uh, landmine, a settlement of uh, landmine uh, issues, um, was it left over by war relic, uh, the role of uh, women and children uh, in conflict, and also um, the impact of climate change uh, on international conflict. And uh, it has also tried to uh, help connect uh, the activities of the UNSC and also like uh, the activity of ASEAN, bridging between UNSC and ASEAN during uh, the time that it served as a non permanent member. So at the moment, Vietnam has been proactive in many uh, with the uh, regional uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, most um, uh, mostly the ASEAN driven. Uh, mechanism, but also beyond that, um, the ASEAN dialogue uh, um, with the partners and also uh, 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 it also try to uh, with the expand uh, the multilateral uh, uh, cooperation with other regional and also inter-regional uh, mechanism as well as global mechanism such as the UN uh, and also, uh, it also participate in emerging China center uh, uh, platform, including uh, the IIB and uh, the BRI uh, and the uh, Lansang uh, Lan Mekong uh, Corporation Mechanism. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, one of the key uh, drivers for Vietnam proactive uh, contribution to multilateral platform is the notion of its uh, international integration objective. So international uh, integration, it has become a key foreign uh, orientation for Vietnam since uh, uh, Vietnam adopting uh, Domoi and particularly uh, since Vietnam uh, joined ASEAN in the uh, uh, five. So uh, at the moment, uh, at first, Vietnam uh, only focused on economic integration, but now, uh, Integration uh, has been uh, integration has been conducted both in depth and breadth, and not only focused on uh, the economic dimension, but also expanded to other like uh, area of politics, securities, uh, we say defense and uh, culture and um, society as well. So uh, uh, next slide, please, and you can see here uh, one of the illustration. Uh, for how uh, Vietnam participate in the regional uh, integration. If you take Vietnam at the center, sorry, uh, this uh, map is uh, uh, prepared by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Vietnam. So it is in Vietnamese, but you can see some of the key uh, regional platform that has been highlighted here, including ASEAN, ASEAN platform, ASEAN plus three ERS, and uh, uh, with the broadening, Vietnam has been very proactive together with Japan in uh, with the, um, uh, re uh, igniting the process for conclusion of the CPTPP after the US withdrawal uh, when Trump 
uh, with the um, came to power in 2017. And also most recently during uh, Vietnam ASEAN Championship, Vietnam has had uh, to conclude uh, the regional uh, economic uh, in, uh, partnership or RCEP. Uh, so uh, they on uh, the regional platform, uh, you can see that Vietnam had just uh, been recently concluded uh, its FTA uh, with the EU, uh, EVFTA uh, with the UK, and uh, is now um, uh, conducting quite a number of uh, negotiations for a new FTA. And also, uh, as I just mentioned, it had uh, also uh, been integrated in uh, the new platform so that the China Central Mechanism, so that IIB or BRI, and uh, some of the Japanese platform, including those in the uh, uh, Mekong sub-region uh, as well. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, the pillar of partnership, uh, you can see here, uh, previously, uh, Vietnam uh, has somehow uh, adopted um, an ideological, ide ideology based uh, with a worldview. So during the Cold War, uh, it partnership usually uh, based on ideology. Uh, so it focused on relation with the socialist countries. And uh, it divided uh, uh, the target countries into friends and enemies. But after the Cold, the Cold War ended, and particularly uh, since 2001, uh, Vietnam no longer refer uh, to uh, countries in the world as uh, enemies. But in, instead, it adopts what we call here uh, partners and subjects, and uh, it plays more important on the notion of partners. So uh, uh, partners have the two sense. Uh, the first thing, um, Vietnam self-identify it as a reliable partner of all nations in the international community and uh, actively uh, taking part in international uh, and regional uh, cooperation process. But at uh, the second uh, aspect of this notion of partner is that Vietnam also try to form multiple type of partnership uh, with other countries. And um, it has at least uh, some kind of uh, level of partnership, including uh, comprehensive partnership, uh, strategic partnership, uh, cooperative partnership, and uh, partnership uh, for development, et cetera. So the next slides uh, will uh, show you uh, uh, at least some of uh, the key partners of Vietnam at the moment. Uh, so you can see here, um, we have uh, at the moment at the highest, highest level of uh, um, relation, we have three special uh, relationship uh, with uh, Laos, uh, Cambodia, and Cuba. So it, um, uh, we, we uh, often refer it, um, these three countries as the traditional uh, with the, uh, uh, partners because uh, the relationship has been fought um, during the Cold War and now uh, together we have support each other in the fight uh, against uh, the invading um, uh, powers. And also uh, uh, now at the moment, we try to help each other in uh, the term of national development. But apart from the three special uh, uh, relationship, uh, the three country that have uh, the highest level of uh, partnership is comprehensive strategic partners, including uh, Russia, China, and India. And at um, uh, the second most important level is the strategic partners. And um, among this, uh, we can see that Japan uh, ranked among the top strategic partner of Vietnam. So actually uh, in 2014, uh, the two countries have upgraded their uh, bilateral relationship to the extensive uh, with a, um, strategic partnership for peace and uh, prosperity in, 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 in Asia. So, and we also have very good relationship with uh, South Korea, Spain, uh, the UK, Germany, uh, Italy, France, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, Australia, and, and New Zealand. And uh, at um, the comprehensive uh, partnership level, uh, the US stand out uh, cooperation in uh, uh, security, defense, and also in terms of uh, economic 
trade relations have been uh, burgeoning in uh, the past decade. And uh, many businesses say that uh, probably because of the, the US concern in, uh, in the South China Sea and also uh, checking China rice. Um, but uh, there are also the notion of uh, economic uh, and trade relation as well. And now we have uh, uh, Canada, South Africa, Chile, Brazil, Venezuela, Argentina, Denmark, amongst other. Uh, and we have one issue-based strategic partner with the Netherlands uh, on uh, the, uh, see, um, in the area of uh, dealing with climate change and uh, improving uh, um, agriculture uh, in Vietnam. Uh, as you know, uh, Vietnam is one of the country uh, that um, is uh, predicted to be uh, most severely uh, hit uh, by uh, the impact of climate change in the coming decades. And the Netherlands have uh, a very good experience in this. So uh, we fought a strategic partner with Netherlands in these issues. So now there's, a, uh, there's an issue uh, that uh, uh, many people are concerned about among these uh, partnership. Uh, uh, what is related to um, the security, uh, prosperity, and also the uh, status of Vietnam in, in the world uh, affairs. So you, uh, if you look at um, the list of these partners, you can see that uh, Vietnam is the only country, uh, probably the, the only Southeast Asian country that fox, uh, that have with the, um, the comprehensive uh, strategic partners or, or uh, strategic partners um, or comprehensive partnership with the all five permanent members of the UN. Uh, if uh, you see uh, the UNSC, it is divided into uh, the Western Bloc, including uh, the US, uh, France, and uh, the UK. And at the other side, you can see that uh, the non-Western Bloc, in, uh, including, uh, we, see, uh, we see here, uh, China and um, uh, and, and Russia, and usually they have conflict uh, in um, how to uh, with a, uh, promoting peace and security, some division over there. But Vietnam uh, is one of the country that uh, have good relationship with all five permanent members of the UNSC. So it's a, something about uh, how these big power evaluate uh, the Vietnam uh, emerging agency and growing agency uh, in the regional and global affairs. And the second thing, uh, if you look at this, uh, the, the kinds of uh, uh, partnership, you can see that uh, Vietnam of um, the relationship mostly with the uh, East Asian uh, neighbor, including ASEAN neighbors, and also uh, important um, not East Asian country, including with China, Japan, and South Korea. So that say a lot about the importance of uh, neighbor diplomacy uh, to Vietnam foreign policy, uh, because it is the, the country that Vietnam located. And this is the country that Vietnam have uh, uh, need to ensure a good uh, relation in order to preserve its uh, uh, surrounding peaceful environment for development. And also these are also the top trading partners of Vietnam, including China, Japan, South Korea, and uh, the ASEAN country, and also top investor as well. So the, in terms of the South China Sea, um, about seven years ago, I uh, did my research and you can see here uh, at the, the JIIA and uh, my topic uh, is uh, on how the Vietnam-Japan strategic partnership uh, can help uh, shape the changing uh, political landscape in East Asia. And uh, we can see that um, uh, over the past decade, the US and Japan and also now uh, since 2017, that is the Quad has been cutting Vietnam uh, with uh, uh, a number of uh, initiatives, um, uh, including in uh, the South China Sea and also in maritime cooperation, uh, joint military exercise or um, uh, some kind of like capacity building and provision of uh, both, uh, was it patron both for the Vietnamese Coast Guard. So that helped uh, to build uh, the capacity of uh, Vietnam uh, in terms of the South China Sea, but at the same time, from the external perspective, uh, we can see that uh, probably because uh, uh, they are um, uh, concerned about China growing a sustenance in, uh, in, in the South China Sea, and, and not only in the South China Sea, but for Japan, 
also in the East uh, China Sea. So um, there are many common interests uh, between uh, Vietnam, uh, the US, Japan, and also the Quad uh, in uh, promoting uh, regional peace and also uh, uh, shaping the rule-based order. But uh, I argue in, 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 in uh, this paper and in this research that, that um, uh, Vietnam status and national interest also somewhat differ from that of the US and Japan. Uh, including it close uh, it independent uh, foreign policy and also um, it, it's the proximity geographical proximity to China so and also it cultural affinity to, to uh, the Chinese civilization so that's why and uh, not to mention um, uh, the close relationship between the two uh, communist party uh, within Vietnam and China. So that had somewhat shaped the different policy and understanding and the view vis-a-vis -vis China among the Vietnam, uh, US and also Japan. So um, uh, the notion here uh, we can see um, is that uh, uh, Vietnam has somewhat adopted um, a quite uh, balanced and somewhat we can call it hedging uh, uh, with a view vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, China in terms of and also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, emerging security bloc in the region including the Quad and uh, the US uh, Japan uh, security alliance uh, in term in this sense. Uh, I leave um, this because I know uh, for the Q&A because I know you will have many uh, detailed questions uh, on this. Next slide, please. So now, in terms of the diversification of relationship, uh, we can uh, see that, um, as I have mentioned during the Cold War, Vietnam just based uh, on its relation with uh, the socialist countries and also uh, uh, some of the traditional country in the third, um, uh, third world, including the development countries. But since uh, Vietnam uh, adopting Doi Mui and particularly since the 21st century, uh, the Vietnam foreign policy has been diversified. So uh, we do not only have a state to state uh, relation with uh, almost every country in the world, but we also forking people to people uh, diplomacy and also uh, uh, party to party diplomacy. So in terms of this diversification, uh, um, a couple of years ago, I have published a piece um, that um, term uh, provides a new term that, that I see it as a kind of Vietnam plumbing bamboo diplomacy. Uh, this bamboo diplomacy is different to Thailand. Um, to that of Thailand. We can know that Thailand is very famous for, for its uh, bamboo diplomacy, uh, which uh, bend whichever way uh, the wind uh, blow in order to, 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 to survive. But Vietnam uh, do not adopt uh, a similar bamboo diplomacy uh, like Thailand in a practical sense. But uh, what I call it clumping bamboo diplomacy. So we can see that um, in the Cold War, Vietnam has uh, adopted uh, a kind of alliance politics. So it aligned first with both the US and China uh, in the wars against the US. And later on, it leaned toward uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why um, China decided to teach Vietnam a lesson. So Vietnam has learned that alliance politics uh, is not good for the country, national interest. So since um, the end of the Cold War, Vietnam had actually implemented uh, an independent and autonomous foreign policy. But without um, even Japan have uh, an ally to uh, have like secure uh, the peace and prosperity for, for Japan. But Vietnam just being a small to medium country without no ally. So how have Vietnam has uh, built up its new diplomacy uh, philosophy? So I argue that uh, Vietnam rely on uh, the clumping bamboo diplomacy. It means that uh, uh, it will not stand alone as one bamboo, but uh, the bamboo here have to be in clump so Vietnam will not, although it has no ally, but it has many partners and many uh, multiple interdependent relationships. 
Uh, so with the hope that if uh, we can intertwine the national interest, uh, our national interest with others, uh, key partners, uh, even though we don't have uh, um, a security alliance with them because of their national interest is intertwined with Vietnam. So they may have Vietnam in case of emergency or, or, or some other uncertain event. So that is the logic of, uh, of the clumping bamboo diplomacy do not stand alone, uh, independent, autonomous, but with friends around, with intertwining relationship uh, so that's it. so so now who are the club that Vietnam rely on? Certainly, the first thing that we may think of is ASEAN. So Vietnam has been very proactive in ASEAN and forking uh, relationship with ASEAN country at the moment. And um, um, so ASEAN is, I think that uh, the decision to join ASEAN and also being a, a full member, proactive member of ASEAN has uh, give Vietnam. Um, uh, um, um, both a tangible and intangible power that um, uh, it can uh, create the leverage for its foreign policy. And second one is the um, with major power. So we see, uh, we can see that uh, uh, Vietnam has fought quite a number of interdependence relationship with the US uh, over the South China Sea also in terms of economic similar with Japan, but also with India, we have a very good relationship with India. Uh, inherited from uh, the Cold War to the moment. Uh, and um, uh, with uh, the EU, we just signed the uh, EBFTA uh, free trade uh, agreement with the EU, and also uh, with China itself, uh, given uh, the many things uh, that I have just mentioned uh, to you about the geographical uh, proximity uh, and also cultural affinities um, and um, mutual interest uh, in terms of regime security. And now we have uh, another clumps that have to build up uh, what is it, the diversification of Vietnam uh, foreign policy with the third world countries. Uh, Vietnam still have a very good uh, soft power in the third world countries. When we say about Ho Chi Minh, uh, Võ Nguyên Giáp, uh, Vietnam is seen as um, a kind of the um, a heroes uh, of uh, uh, we say in the fight against foreign enemies and in the current context, Vietnam is seen as um, Dr. Uh, uh, Ardeni and have just mentioned, uh, Vietnam is seen as a more of successful integration into the world and uh, with its rapid uh, economic development and stability. So uh, it has somehow, and also now at the moment, um, its achievement in uh, obtaining uh, the MDG and FDG. And uh, it's growing club. Uh, with like-minded countries, uh, including other middle power. So it joined the CAN groups um, you know, led by uh, Australia in terms of uh, uh, reform of agricultural reform in the WTO. It joined the group of VISTA of emerging market, uh, what call, including Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, uh, South Africa, Turkey, and Argentina. And it is seen at one of the next 11 after the BRICS who can become uh, the emerging power in the future. So next slide, please. Uh, yes, about the future, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, so we see here about the future direction. Um, the recently concluded um, um, 13 party Congress in uh, um, January, 2021. Uh, have to somewhat uh, provide uh, an evaluation of the challenges and opportunities for Vietnam. In terms of challenges, uh, it see that the world uh, that uh, uh, witnessed uh, many conflicts, including a roaring strategic competition among the big powers, uh, and also uh, the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, the setback of multilateralism and international laws, uh, but, um, and also uh, uh, the fear or the concerns uh, of Vietnam being left behind uh, in terms of uh, this kind of uh, digital uh, industrial revolution uh, 4.0, but also in terms of opportunities, it's see that uh, Vietnam national power and status have never, be, have never been that you know, as good as the moment. And now also, 
uh, it see many changes uh, for Vietnam in terms of uh, economic development uh, and also uh, the growing prestige of the, uh, of the country in the region and the world. Uh, and now uh, one of the uh, key highlight uh, of uh, the 13th Party Congress res um, re resolution is uh, what I term uh, uh, the emerging middle power objective for Vietnam. So the resolution of the Congress state that Vietnam will try to become a developing country with upper medium income level by 2030. So 2030 is, um, it marked the 100 years anniversary of the establishment of the Vietnam Communist Party. And it will try to become a developed country with a high income by uh, 2045. 2045 mark uh, the 100 years anniversary of uh, the establishment of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. So we see here uh, uh, what I call, uh, and I and my some of my colleagues have started to study about the Vietnam uh, middle power objective and also its middle power behavior, including uh, we can see that the conduct of Vietnam foreign policy have somewhat uh, replicate uh, the foreign policy of uh, emerging middle power, including uh, uh, the support of multilateralism uh, and also the rule-based order. Uh, Vietnam also tried to become an honest broker, an honest broker and uh, a mediator, for example, in 2019, uh, it served as a uh, uh, the host country for the second um, Trump and Kim uh, summit in Hanoi. And at the moment, it tried to also uh, uh, help settle uh, the Myanmar uh, conflict at the moment. Uh, and uh, also, it starts to define its niche diplomacy by focusing on um, the impact of climate change um, and also water diplomacy uh, involving uh, the uh, water issues in the Mekong sub uh, region, uh, and also it uh, be is very concerned in terms of uh, um, uh, sustainable development. So those are some areas of Vietnam niche diplomacy, and also this is also trying to. Uh, I think that uh, one of the notion that have established the Vietnam uh, agency at the middle uh, power, emerging middle power in the region at the moment is its balance of relationship and uh, the leverage that it can have uh, in the relation with the uh, major power. So um, those all, uh, this short presentation is just to help you to have uh, uh, a glimpse of a picture of Vietnam foreign policy. Uh, uh, so I look forward to receiving your question uh, and uh, further elaboration on that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Do, for the very illuminating presentation. Uh, having heard from our distinguished speaker in a couple of minutes, I will turn to our audience for their questions. Uh, the instructions for Q&A are flashed on your screen, will be flashed on your screen. Um, but to ask a question and or to comment, please use the raise hand function located on the participants tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, wait to be called and unmuted by our staff before speaking. Um, please state your name, position, and affiliation before commenting or asking questions. Alternatively, you can also post your question on the Q&A tab. But if you're going to do that, uh, please don't forget to identify yourself by uh, writing your name and affiliation. So, a uh, very good presentation. Perhaps to jumpstart our conversation, uh, let me ask the first question. A lot of people have been really curious about how Vietnam has uh, handled the, and is handling the COVID-19 pandemic. And you know, we live in Japan and in terms of population density, Japan and Vietnam are pretty similar. But you know, the entire time, Vietnam has only had less than 4,000 total cases. Japan has over 650,000 cases. And this is not to put Japan in a bad light because most developed countries are not as successful as Vietnam in dealing with the crisis. So perhaps this is not related to foreign policy directly, but obviously Vietnam's handling of COVID-19 has improved Vietnam, Vietnam's image or soft power, if you will. What is the secret? Um, why is Vietnam so successful in addressing COVID-19? 
Yes, uh, thank you. That is a really good question, but and actually it's not a secret because it had make uh, been public. It had been public to uh, everyone who are uh, who who were with it, uh, have a close eye on Vietnam recently. Uh, I think that the, the fact that Vietnam controlled effectively uh, the spread of the COVID-19 at the countries, uh, although uh, we say despite the fact that it is very close to China. Uh, with the, uh, the origin of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic. And at the moment, uh, with uh, Thailand, uh, Laos, and Cambodia, which uh, have uh, increasing uh, number of cases. And also, it also has uh, the maritime borders. Uh, so uh, it's quite complicated. And also, we can see that the, the population of Vietnam is uh, very uh, big. I think that it's big. Uh, compared to the size of the countries, almost 100 million people. So how Vietnam have uh, uh, have uh, control the spread of the COVID uh, the COVID pandemic? The first thing is um, the rapid reaction and also very quick reaction and decisive uh, reaction from the government. So uh, we um, target the right um, uh, and we circulate the right. Uh, zone of uh, quarantine uh, and um, we say we trace uh, uh, the process of uh, uh, interaction of the people infected and we quarantine immediately and uh, we say uh, that is one of the reason um, the reason the second reason is uh, the people awareness so unlike in other countries um, with it, although the, Ch the Japanese also have very high uh, with the people awareness, but in Vietnam, uh, we also like uh, uh, stimulate and circulate uh, some slogan like uh, during the quarantine time uh, and lockdown time. So staying at home is to love the countries. So it just spread from one uh, to the other. So it stimulates somewhat like the, the common uh, uh, community reaction. Uh, to uh, the pandemic. And third thing that I think that um, the Vietnamese people uh, take the pandemic very seriously. So we think that this is the real problem. So I think that um, uh, one of the reasons is that uh, Vietnam, uh, the, the Vietnamese people and also the Vietnamese government understand uh, the, ser uh, the severity of this pandemic uh, right from the very beginning. So it had adopted strict policy uh, stimulate um, uh, the awareness and also the common reaction, including many good behavior, like uh, you have the RISE ATM. Uh, those who are in need during the uh, pandemic, you can uh, go to the RISE ATM to receive some kind of uh, RISE that is enough for the poor people to survive uh, during the pandemic. And I think that uh, most serious, uh, most um, importantly is uh, uh, the cooperation um, of the people with uh, the government policy. So that's why um, the policy work well, and also the people uh, also uh, have, uh, what is it, build um, such a success uh, for uh, the control uh, measure and also policy. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have three raised hands and a, and a lot of questions in the Q&A tab. Uh, let me take, uh, I guess, in the interest of time, I'm going to take two questions at once. So I'm going to take Sade Greenwood and Kitty Prasit Suk first. Um, Sade, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor. Good evening, Professor Do. My name is Sade Greenwood. I'm an undergraduate student of IR at uh, TIU. Uh, thank you so much for conducting today's seminar. And my question today is, how does Vietnam handle foreign policies in the 21st century with China over the Spratly Islands? Is there a potential for this dispute to affect relations between the countries in the future, especially since China is a top trader with Vietnam? Thank you. All right, uh, um, uh, hold it there first. Um, uh, let's, okay. Yeah, you let's it. collect questions and then uh, cool. uh, you can respond. Um, Kitty. Uh, hi, good, good evening. Thank you so much, Professor Tuido, for your illuminating uh, presentation. My name is Kitty, a professor of political science at Thammasat University in Bangkok, Thailand. 
I have to interrelate that question with a so relevant to the previous question. The question is on China. Uh, I think you you emphasize at the conclusion that Vietnam would like to have balanced relation with major powers. And given the South China Sea dispute and a little bit historical animosity with China, how Vietnam uh, would manage the relationship with China. And another question which is related is on niche diplomacy. You mentioned about a water management that uh, Vietnam would like to play a role to mediate about water management in, in Mekong and also that also relevant to China. And could you please elaborate on that? Thank you so much. All right, Professor Do, floor is yours. Uh, thank you. So two questions that related to uh, Vietnam uh, relation with China and particularly the South China Sea is partly dispute. So um, um, at the moment, um, when we studying about um, the Vietnam China relation, uh, there is a, a, a slogan that uh, I usually uh, quoted in my research about Vietnam relation with uh, with China. Uh, the first one is um, looking at the big picture. So I think that uh, the leadership in both Vietnam and China understand that uh, uh, Vietnam and China have many common interests in the region and also in their national development. China also need uh, first thing uh, surrounding uh, peaceful uh, environment for its rights. Also, China need to build up uh, the uh, image of uh, uh, responsible, great power, rising great power. And uh, Vietnam, uh, China also try to build up its soft power in terms of uh, 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 neighboring diplomacy. So, and Vietnam, I think that uh, Vietnam standing in terms of the strategic mindset of uh, Chinese foreign policy making is also quite, quite um, uh, important. So Vietnam uh, linked, uh, connect the southern part of China to that of uh, uh, what do you call here, um, Southeast Asia. So the BRI, uh, there's number of project that uh, can connect the southern part of China through Vietnam, through Southeast Asia. Uh, and also, as I just mentioned about Vietnam roles in ASEAN and its relation with other great power. So I think that uh, looking at the big picture and that is not to mention the uh, common ideology at the moment. So both are socialistic. So we have very close party to party relationship. So if you look at uh, that um, angle, you can see that uh, uh, when they, um, uh, think about uh, the South China Sea dispute or the Spratly dispute. It is one. It is the the most the thorniest issue in Vietnam China relation. But this is also one issue among the many aspects of Vietnam China relation, uh, including um, a very good trade. Uh, with a uh, relationship between the two countries. So uh, I think that um, both countries understand the important of the other countries in their foreign policy uh, and also in terms of security and development. So that's why when uh, they think about, they repeat it once again, um, one time and when every time they meet, is that uh, looking at the big picture. Uh, so the Spratly Island is just one of the issues in the overall relation of Vietnam. And second, how Vietnam cope with and China was the increasing assertive uh, behavior, so-called that uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, the first thing, as I just mentioned, uh, Vietnam rely on, on um, international laws, uh, the UN laws, uh, and uh, also it try to form multiple, uh, mutual, multiple interrelationship uh, with other great power, including China. For example, like uh, it opened the Cam Ranh Bay uh, for logistics, uh, and also uh, like uh, passing and some kind of like, logistic services for foreign ship, including foreign military ship. So if you just pass by and many, including um, the Japanese have sent uh, their military ship uh, for services uh, in, in the Cameron Bay and Cameron Bay, if you say it oppositely, it um, uh, was it uh, directly facing uh, the South China Sea. 
So, and also Vietnam tried to, uh, what is it, uh, invite uh, some kind of like uh, uh, foreign company to invest in the exploration in um, the country, uh, in the zone within the Vietnam EEZs, with the hope that if uh, you know, we can uh, what is it, invite them to invest here because of uh, the benefit of their, uh, uh, what is it, company, oil company, uh, they will raise their voice or even intervene if uh, China did something in the South China Sea. For example, like um, uh, India once sent its uh, military ship to escort uh, the joint exploration uh, side um, between uh, China, um, Indian oil company and, and Vietnam, so in the South China Sea. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, as it had happened, the most serious incident in 2014, that is uh, the oil rig incident uh, in uh, 2014. So Vietnam relied on its party-to-party -party relationship with China, try to persuade China to de-escalate. Because unlike other countries, uh, Japan does not have, but Vietnam has. That is the hotline between the top leader and uh, between the two foreign policy, they can call to de-escalate. So I think that um, uh, although there are many concerns about uh, the South China Sea, uh, I think that uh, both countries uh, need to look at the big picture. And for the Vietnam, as I just mentioned, uh, the, the logic uh, is read on Ho Chi Minh thought that Vietnam is always keen uh, on firm on principle. And the principle is that the you know, integrity uh, of Vietnam territory the security and development of Vietnam, but we are flexible in strategy and tactics, including that with China, with other countries and partners in order to resolve uh, the, you know, the dispute. So those are the Vietnamese uh, perspective in terms of, uh, of this issue. Uh, relating to your question about the water management in, in the Mekong subregion, uh, at the moment you can see that the, the Vietnamese farmer in uh, the Mekong Delta, uh, has been suffer, suffering from uh, many uh, negative impact of the upstream um, Mekong activities, including uh, the decision of China and Laos to build up hydro dams uh, uh, across the Mekong River. So it uh, has somewhat, um, uh, what's it resulted in uh, like drought or uh, uh, um, uh, some kind of saltation of the uh, uh, of the, of the land, uh, oil, uh, soil degradation of uh, Vietnamese, uh, was it Mekong uh, Delta. So um, water management has been one of the top concern for the economics and um, security de the development of Vietnam. So Vietnam has uh, joined, the first one is the uh, Mekong uh, River Commission. And also it also joined um, the emerging uh, China initiative of uh, Lantang uh, Mekong uh, Corporation LMC. And uh, it also joined uh, some of uh, the other uh, initiative by the US, including the lower Mekong initiative, uh, the Japanese one uh, in terms of development of the Mekong sub uh, region. And also it um, will uh, coordinate separately with Laos uh, with Cambodia in terms of, uh, uh, of how to manage uh, in terms of the water management uh, in, in the Mekong uh, subregion. And it has brought up these issues at the ASEAN uh, summit um, in 2020 last year. Thank you, Professor Do. Um, before we move to other questions, just last question on the South China Sea issue, because you mentioned reliance uh, on international law. Uh, what is the likelihood of Vietnam filing a legal case or, or an other arbitration case against China? Uh, in other words, what will push Vietnam to follow the lead of the Philippines and use the judicial settlement process provided by UNCLOS in trying to resolve the maritime disputes in the South China Sea? Yeah. Um, uh, um... Since uh, the 2014 oil incidents, uh, so Vietnam, uh, so that is the most, uh, so far the most serious case is involving Vietnam and China in the South China Sea 
uh, in since in the Cold War. So Vietnam has started uh, thinking about such a uh, possibility, and uh, we also uh, closely watch uh, the case that the Philippines brought uh, against China uh, to the permanent court in La, uh, in the Hague. Uh, but there are both pros and cons uh, for such a legal uh, suit. Uh, on uh, well, with it, um, your question about what may prompt Vietnam uh, to follow up um, uh, with the, uh, the step of the Philippines in bringing this issue to, to, to uh, uh, the court. I think that um, there is a red line. And the red line, the red line here is uh, uh, the top national interest. And the top national interest of Vietnam is uh, the integrity, integrity of its territory. So if China, uh, I say, if China occupied by military force, um, like an island or island currently occupied by Vietnam, or if something more serious uh, happening, um, or is it more than uh, the case of Irish incident? So that may prompt uh, Vietnam to follow suit. But uh, as I also mentioned, there is a cons. The cons here is that uh, this legal suit, as had happened with the case of the Philippines, uh, is not, uh, what is it, is it not mandatory? If, I mean, uh, so it does not have uh, the binding that China have to do this, have to do that. Uh, the Philippine case have just mentioned the Philippine won, but nothing changed. And the second, because of the change of the government in the Philippines, but otherwise, uh, if the former, uh, I mean, uh, the former administration in the Philippines still stay in power, China will pressure military, economically, uh, was it to change the behavior of the Philippines. Just luckily that uh, the Philippines have a, a new administration. But it has happened with Australia at the moment. They just, was it, suggest for legal independence uh, investigation on the origin of, uh, of, of COVID-19 and see what pressure China had been putting on Australia. So I think that as long as China do not cross the, deadline, the red line, Vietnam would not uh, come to such, uh, such action because it would ruin the relationship. And, uh, and, and that is not in the interest of Vietnam or China to do so. Right. The bottom line is it's on the table, it's 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 one of the options that Vietnam has moving forward. Have been discussed, have been thought of, but uh, with a lot of consideration. Right. Uh, so let's move forward with two more questions. I'm gonna call on Min Vu and Tan Van Vu. Min Vu, Min Vu first. Go ahead, please. Barry. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, professors. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is Ming. I'm from Vietnam, and I'm a third-year student at uh, Tokyo International University. And I actually have uh, a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the first one is related to a question asked by Professor Kitty, I believe, which is uh, in regards to the Mekong Basin. Uh, so my question is, how should Vietnam resolve this issue? Should we adopt the bilateral approach and discuss the issue with uh, other actors like China or Laos, as you've mentioned? Or should we opt for more, more multilateral approach by joining other countries with Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and maybe even the US as well? Uh, that's my first question. Uh, my second question is about the Vietnamese and Japanese relations. So uh, in recent years, Japan has become a very important partner with us, and it is Japan is now a strategic partner with us. Uh, do you think that there is a possibility that Vietnam would upgrade that uh, partnership to become a comprehensive strategic partner like that of uh, Russia, China, and India? Uh, that's my second question. And I have a third question. Uh, my third question is uh, in regards to the China and US conflict, actually. Uh, since there has been a lot of talks about the tension between the two countries, uh, do you think, which approach do you think Vietnam should take if 
there is if the conflict is to escalate more. I know that Joe Biden is in the Oval Office now and he's working toward de-escalating, but should the uh, conflict or should tensions escalate, do you think Vietnam should opt to make a similar relationship like between US and Canada or sh how should we approach it essentially? Thank you very much. All right, uh, the other hand has been put down. So let's ask uh, uh, Vo Fong first. Vo? Um, actually, my name is Fong. So yeah, I'm a Vietnamese student, our student here in National University. Um, so as far as, as far as I'm concerned, you know, for now, China has, you know, um, prohibited, you know, Philippines and Vietnamese fishermen from, you know, fishing in around, in a few areas around the South China Sea. So if this escalation goes on, would Vietnam react to this movement in a different manner? Or maybe, you know, filing case or something? Yeah, thank you. All right, Professor? All right, uh, so for question, um, I will answer, try to answer, uh, Best okay. So the first one about the uh, water management in the Mekong Basin. Uh, at the moment, uh, Vietnam uh, uh, relied on a multilateral platform, as I just uh, mentioned, including uh, the Mekong uh, River uh, the Commission and also L um, uh, LMC uh, Lantang Mekong Corporation. Uh, but uh, we say this is kind of mini mini lateral platform uh, may not be effective because the more uh, you involve uh, the more countries you involve, uh, you need to form consensus, which is also tough when it's uh, related to this um, issues of national interest. So another aspect is to uh, uh, fork. Uh, with a uh, bilateral settlement. So Vietnam have discussed uh, with uh, separately with uh, Laos and also of course um, you know, with China and also Cambodia. So at the result, uh, Laos has the temporary, I mean, they still go ahead, but uh, because of uh, uh, the Vietnamese uh, lobbies, so they have somewhat uh, thinking about the new project on uh, building the new dam. Uh, in, uh, in in the Mekong River, um, yeah. So, uh, but uh, we also have to take into uh, consideration uh, consideration the, the interest as well. Uh, the interest of Laos is uh, to build a new dam, uh, with a hydro dam, because uh, they have investment from China and other uh, partners. But also it uh, bring the money and um, also uh, it also help some kind in terms of the water management uh, in Laos as well. So usually in, in, in this sense, uh, it's more with, uh, with, with, with Laos national interest, but uh, the Vietnam's uh, lobbying and advocacy, I think that has somewhat have the modest uh, effect on this. Uh, and this is very tough issues. Um, probably uh, when uh, the impact of, the, of, of these issues on uh, the Vietnam Mekong Delta become more serious, Vietnam would take um, uh, more what is it, top uh, uh, action and um, what is it, decisive action on this. Uh, and, but for, uh, for the moment, they, they still rely on both multilateral and bilateral platform. And also, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, with the uh, support financial one uh, of uh, the US, Japan, uh, and also China, India, and South Korea, um, this could be uh, put into the agenda uh, of um, regional cooperation in terms of uh, how to make uh, the Mekong uh, sub-region uh, development become more sustainable. Uh, that is the first, uh, first question. The second one, regarding uh, whether Vietnam and Japan uh, relationship be, um, be, be, be promoted to the next level. Um, at the uh, reason, um, just um, yesterday, uh, when, uh, when the, our new uh, state president have uh, uh, a phone call uh, with the uh, Prime Minister uh, Yoshihide, uh, Vietnam reiterate that um, Japan is a leading partner of Vietnam. But uh, whether or not to remove from the current level of uh, strategic partnership to the comprehensive strategic partnership, 
it uh, it have to always say answer the two um, I think that the, the two the two aspect uh, the first one is um, uh, Vietnam need to uh, look at uh, China reaction because uh, uh, Japan has entered the court and um, talking uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, what is it, uh, uh, strategic partnership with Japan uh, it may uh, what is it, arouse some skepticism in China and the second thing uh, we understand that uh, Japan have uh, its limitation itself including uh, the current uh, uh, limitation and restriction on this uh, security and strategic maneuver overseas. Uh, and uh, you know, a comprehensive strategic partnership, it implies much in terms of uh, military and uh, defense cooperation um, in terms of security. And Japan is still face domestic restraint on this. But at the moment, uh, actually, Japan stand out at the level between strategic partner and comprehensive strategic partner because we have extensive strategic partners for uh, security and prosperity in Asia. So it extensive strategic partner is saying something about the importance of Japan uh, that is different from the other strategic partner, but it not yet reach the level of the comprehensive strategic partner in that sense, we say mostly um, within uh, the restriction of, of, of Japan internal um, restriction. Your third question about um, uh, how should Vietnam do in terms of the US-China uh, conflict. So um, we, uh, we, uh, we like other Southeast Asian countries, uh, we think that um, there are two scenarios for, for, for uh, the regional country, including Vietnam. Uh, the first one, uh, U.S.-China reconciliation, uh, which is good for global security and uh, uh, and also prosperity, but that probably may not uh, have to push uh, the leverage of smaller countries like Southeast Asian one because if uh, uh, they can have a condominium or uh, uh, some kind of collaboration without uh, with neglecting the interests of the Southeast Asian countries. But at the other hand, if they enter conflict, uh, that is not good as well, because we have just said that uh, when the elephant fight, the mosquitoes suffer. And uh, that's mosquitoes, including uh, with the regional countries, smaller state here. So the best scenario for countries like uh, Vietnam, to maneuver in this sense, I think is uh, uh, US-China region have somewhat, uh, uh, they still have some conflict, uh, but at this, because uh, when they have conflict, they will need the support of smaller state in Vietnam, but at the same time, that conflict should not, uh, or was a dispute should not, was a culminate to like open a military conflict, that's not good for the region. So Vietnam will try to help and together with ASEAN, uh, to have, uh, what is it, set up, uh, what is it, uh, build a background, or stimulate uh, the red power competition in that strand, which actually uh, help promote in um, ASEAN centrality in terms of uh, the red power, uh, what is it, dominance in the region. So that's my approach. And your last question about the fishing ban on China in, in, in the South China Sea. Uh, um, Vietnam, every time that China imposed a new fishing ban in Vietnam, uh, in, in, in um, the South China Sea, uh, Vietnamese spokesperson um, say that um, that is against international law and Vietnam does not support that. So it is um, against um, uh, we say, uh, also the uh, overall relationship of, uh, of, of the two countries. So um, by um, uh, re emphasizing re um, emphasizing it uh, again and again. Uh, we hope to set um, with a, uh, a, a common uh, response that um, the fishing ban that China unilaterally uh, imposed in South China Sea is illegal. And which I think that the Philippines also have uh, the similar approach. And um, uh, actually Vietnam and the Philippines also have, although we have different approach, uh, but we also have some collaboration in this sense, uh, in the strategic and also um, Vietnam and the Philippines may bring this issue to the ASEAN first.
uh, before uh, thinking about because at the moment uh, China and ASEAN country is uh, negotiating on the code of conduct in the South China Sea and fishing ban uh, kind of uh, should be one of uh, the uh, the, the main um, target of the COC. So we will try to resolve it bilaterally and with the involved country and through ASEAN platform first before uh, we thinking of, about bringing, um, as I sister mentioned, um, if China does not uh, cross the red line, so everything can be settled within the current framework. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Do. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but uh, with your indulgence, uh, maybe we can answer a couple of more questions before we end. Uh, are we still okay. good to go? Yeah. Sure. So, I'm, so instead of um, you know giving you just two or three questions, I'm going to read a couple of questions, and then I'm going to let you decide which ones to answer. All right. Okay. Um, I think that's a better approach here. Uh, so there is a question here about. South Korea Vietnam relations. What do you think about the relations between Vietnam and South Korea, given Vietnam's silence over Korean atrocities in the past? And I think this question is related to uh, the comfort women issue. Uh, you know, South Korea sent soldiers to the Vietnam War, and Korean soldiers were allegedly involved in in abusing local women. So uh, uh, I guess this uh, this is an anonymous question from someone uh, mm -hmm. on the Q and A tab. And another question that we have is from Han, who's a third year student at TIU. Uh, do you think with the new administration, how will Vietnam respond to the Belt and Road Initiative and the Free and Open Indo Pacific Strategy? I think this is in reference to uh, the new administration in the United States. Um, and then. Uh, another question from Nazar. Um, can you elaborate more on the special relations between Vietnam and Laos slash Cambodia? What was the reason behind this special relations? And what would be the way forward for these relations amid increasing China or Chinese influence on both Laos and Cambodia? And another question from Nicolas Chapman. A professor at Tohoku University, what role do you think free trade agreements such as the Vietnam EU FTA, the uh, CPTPP, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP will play in helping Vietnam escape the middle income trap? And I think uh, uh, Professor Chapman was intrigued by your comment a while ago about Vietnam's ambitious economic goals, right? Like, for example, uh, reaching a high income status by 2045. Um, and so that's that's all. Um, over to you. Uh, thank you uh, for your interest. Uh, I will try uh, to answer all if I can. Uh, so the first one is South Korea Vietnam relation. Um, uh, it has been uh, steadfastly uh, developing uh, in the past two decades. Uh, and to the point uh, where we see that um, South Korea has become one of the top investors and uh, also um, uh, top trading partner of Vietnam and also in terms of soft power, the young generation of Vietnam, uh, they know everything about uh, the Korean pop culture and uh, singer and um, TV series and uh, Kyle. Uh, so uh, the reason why uh, the issues of the um, the past uh, war involvement of, uh, of of South Korea in Vietnam have not been uh, become an issue in Vietnam. Uh, I think that it's not only related to the case of South Korea, but also it's uh, it's also applied in the case of uh, Japan and also U.S. So Vietnam, uh, particularly with the U.S., you will see that U.S. commit a lot of uh, what's it of crimes. Um, during the war in Vietnam for 30 years. Um, and with that, the involvement of its ally, including uh, and, uh, South Korea and Australia, and uh, previously, uh, Japan also involved in Vietnam during uh, the 1940s uh, time. But all the issues had not become a big problem in, uh, in, in um, the uh, relationship uh, between Vietnam and these countries. 
Uh, I think I, I don't say that um, the, the Vietnamese people is more tolerant uh, than than all the society, all the people. But I do say that the Vietnamese people is more foreign, uh, with the future oriented thinking uh, than, uh, than, than than at least some some of our neighbors. Uh, what the Vietnamese people think is uh, about the present and the future, what that country has been having uh, and also talking in relation uh, with Vietnam at the moment. Uh, and the problem of the past, we usually um, think that uh, maybe uh, let the Bible bygone be bygone and uh, looking toward the future, uh, if uh, uh, we can talk the common future. Um, yes, there is um, only, I think it's the only uh, problem uh, in the past that uh, may have consequences uh, for the Vietnam foreign policy is, um, is um, that um, between Vietnam and China, uh, given that uh, China had invaded Vietnam for a thousand of years. So what they remember most is uh, about the experience, historical experience with China and other countries had been uh, I somewhat like overshadowed by that uh, engagement with, with, with China in history. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. Uh, second, about um, how Vietnam new administration uh, will react to BRI and for it. Uh, actually, uh, we, we, we um, try together with Indonesia, Singapore, and other ASEAN in building up uh, a common ASEAN outlook on BRI and for it. Uh, with that, as I just mentioned, uh, um, given uh, Vietnam and other ASEAN countries' status as a small uh, and uh, medium countries in, in the region, we actually don't want uh, a single power uh, dominance or framework in the region, uh, rather than we try to help them involve with the current ASEAN-led mechanism and framework and uh, promoting ASEAN centrality in the region. So that's why I think that the Vietnam and perhaps other ASEAN, uh, except for Laos and Cambodia, and perhaps uh, Myanmar before the coup, uh, that we try to balance um, the two initiatives, uh, do not lean on uh, one um, activity. So that's why Vietnam has been involved in both uh, for if dialogue, you know, where they, uh, there are some kind of like the quad plus mechanism that involved in Vietnam, but we also participated in um, the conference of uh, the BRI with some of the project um, being uh, put forward, but the Vietnamese quite prudent in that we try to balance um, the influence of these two power in Vietnam and in the region as well. And, and as I just mentioned, trying to promote ASEAN in centrality in state. In terms of what makes the relationship between Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia that special, uh, I think that, that there are three things. The first thing is about the geographical uh, proximity. We, we are called Indochina, yeah, uh, for a sense. And uh, we used to suffer the same history under uh, the French colonization and also later on the US um, with the uh, invasion. So true uh, history is that uh, that the three countries stand uh, stood together uh, in terms of uh, national defense, and uh, to the moment, and you can see that uh, that is still pretty much uh, was they inherit. And the second, what makes them special is that uh, almost the leaders in Cambodia and Laos uh, they used to study and even take. Part, uh, took part in uh, what is it, uh, the revolutionary activities in Vietnam. So they are fluent in terms of, uh, they speak Vietnamese, they understand the Vietnamese culture. And uh, so that's why uh, every time that ASEAN meet, uh, we can see that the dialogue between the three, um, uh, what is it, president or vice uh, minister, and um, they can even use Vietnamese uh, for their own conversation without uh, translation. So that's the, the second thing. And the third thing, um, also because of uh, Vietnam also support, and also Vietnam want to, uh, as I just say, uh, as I just mentioned, like uh, uh, Vietnam also want uh, to keep very good relationship with these two countries uh, amongst uh, the competition, um, uh, not only, uh, 
China, but also US, Japan, and Thailand, and etc. Um, so far, a lot of competition here in, in, in Indochina, and uh, some, as I just mentioned, Laos and Cambodia have been leaning more toward more uh, toward China more. Uh, this is uh, something that even Vietnam cannot do because uh, China has money. It has political leverage and it's a rising power. Vietnam is just a small country. So what we lean on is, uh, as I just mentioned, past history uh, and also Laos and Vietnam understand, uh, Laos and Cambodia understand the importance of Vietnam as well uh, in the region um, for their own security. So although they lean toward uh, China more and more in recently, uh, they still keep at least uh, like uh, some respect and um, also um, they still think over uh, a little bit. Um, I, don't, I, I cannot say much, but uh, uh, to a certain extent, when they fork a uh, relation with China and other power uh, and thinking uh, of food issue in the case of Vietnam, what Vietnam would think in that case. And uh, lastly, about uh, the prospect of um, forking new FTA uh, in, in, in helping Vietnam to escape the middle income trap. Uh, I think that um, Vietnam is quite excited in terms of uh, concluding uh, um, and also implementing uh, new F, new area F, F, FTA uh, in the past uh, few years. And um, uh, they are like, like in other countries, when you enter FTA, there are a lot of internal debate on whether this F, new FTA will bring the benefit or uh, with a negative consequence for the society and the countries. Uh, Vietnam uh, is just uh, at the moment the low uh, income level and uh, the middle income trap has been uh, identified as one of the challenges that Vietnam will need to overcome in order to always uh, grow to the middle power status, as I just mentioned. So um, we uh, still evaluate that uh, uh, FTA, these FTA bring more benefit than um, challenges for Vietnam development, uh, particularly uh, because of Vietnam is uh, developing. Uh, we open the door very late compared to other countries. So uh, only uh, the past 30 years, so the status of lagging behind. Uh, so by entering these uh, new FTA and these new FTA, they have very, uh, what is it particularly with C CTPP and uh, also uh, EVFTA, they have very strict uh, uh, articles and requirements in terms of structural reform and also sustainable development. So pay attention to those issues like environment. And also it also uh, with a focus more on the aspect that Vietnam want to catch up uh, in order for not letting um, being left behind, including uh, digital uh, transition uh, and um, industrial revolution for point zero uh, kind of. So I think that uh, by entering these, from my own perspective, by entering these uh, new FTA, the uh, first one, it opened new trade related we say opportunities for the country. At the same time, it's forced, we say it is kind of like uh, a pressure for Vietnam to adopt many reform. And these reform may be good uh, for, we say, escaping the middle income trap. And um, third thing, uh, it opened new uh, with a opportunities for forking relations with new partners with the as they say forking multiple interdependent relationship is one of the philosophy of vietnam coming back with diplomacy so all that um, i think that um, may help in uh with a uh, helping vietnam to escape the middle in the income trap and um, realize their development goals thank you very much Very interesting and insightful discussion. Thank you, Professor Do. Um, unfortunately, we are already out of time. Uh, we went over time for about 25 minutes. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. This has been a very productive discussion. Uh, thank you to all who are joining us. Uh, please stay tuned for TIU Global Dialogue number 10, moderated by my colleague, Professor Shin Sojin, happening next month on June 16 at 4 p.m. Japan time. Uh, the theme of that session is economic fallout of the COVID crisis 
Emerging Economy Challenges with guest speaker, Dr. Duguri Subarao, former governor of the Reserve Bank of India. So he was formerly India's uh, central bank chief. So please stay tuned for that and register. Thanks again, everybody. See you next time. Goodbye for now.